Welcome to Always Ready, a production of thechristianmanifesto.org, where we seek to equip others to apply a biblical worldview in all of life. I am your host, Jared Links, and in this episode today, we will be talking about worldview thinking. How do we learn to see the interconnected nature of ideas and beliefs? How do we, as Christians, develop the ability to focus on specific issues, specific beliefs that we see in society today that are false, and not only see those individual issues, but the greater systems of thought behind them. The Christian Manifesto and this podcast exist to assist Christians in wielding the sword of truth, the scripture, in every area of life. We strive to defend the truth of Christ against the false ideas of the world so that souls may be won through the proclamation of the gospel and the entire word of God. And so it is fitting to begin this podcast by considering the topic of worldview together, since that particular discussion is paramount to everything that this organization, the Christian Manifesto, and this particular podcast, Always Ready, will seek to pursue in the future. So I want to start off by giving a definition of that word, worldview, which some of you may already be familiar with that term. For some of you, it may be a brand new term that you're not uh, familiar with in your past. And so I want to read this definition here. This is from Dr. Jason Lyle. His book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation, is an absolutely fantastic defense of biblical Christianity, and it, it is a great resource for helping to equip believers to know how to defend the faith. But when talking about worldview, Dr. Lyle, he says this, He says, we all have a way of thinking about the world, a worldview. Our worldview contains our most strongly held convictions about how the world works, how it came to be, the nature of reality, the nature of truth, and how we should live. And so I want you to notice right off the bat here, it's not a question of do you have a worldview, it's what worldview are you going to have, that this is something that every single person has, whether they acknowledge it or not, you, every single individual has a belief regarding the nature of truth, uh, regarding such subjects as does God exist? Who is God? How has he revealed himself to us? What are we as human beings called to do in this life? Um, what is our ultimate purpose? All of these questions and many, many more that we could talk about, they are worldview questions. And that is why we must learn to be worldview thinkers. But more than that, we must make sure that we have a biblical worldview. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so I want you to see that that God does not want us as Christians to just somehow completely disengage our minds. Our minds are to be actively used for the glory of God. In fact, they're to be transformed to his will. That, That is the contrast here in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And so as we're considering this topic of worldview, it is good that we're seeking to use our minds for the glory of God. And that means that on the one hand, we need to be transformed by the scripture because it is God's revelation to us. We need to be submitted to the Bible in every single way, in all of our thinking and all of our living. But we also need to jettison the ideas of the world. We need to make sure that we're not being conformed to the false world system around us, that we're not being taken captive by the false ideologies, by the false belief systems and worldviews of this earth. We need to make sure that we are only taken captive, that we are only captive to Christ through his word. And the other thing that this brings us to whatever we're considering the topic of worldview, 
is is the scripture sufficient to inform a worldview? Do, do we have everything that we need for life and godliness in the Bible, in the 66 books of inspired scripture? And to that we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 where the Apostle Paul is writing to his young son in the faith who is in the midst of many pastoral difficulties and he needs counsel in this particular instance. And and Paul is providing that. He is wanting Timothy to conduct himself in such a way that he stands firm for the truth of God despite all of the errors and all of the falsehoods coming against him and despite the fact that he himself will have to suffer for his faith. And so this is quite the perilous situation that Timothy is in. And, and Paul says this to him in 2 Timothy three sixteen through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so right here, This is, of course, before the famous charge by Paul in chapter 4 that many of you are going to be familiar with, where he tells Timothy to preach the word. Here he is telling Timothy that the scripture has everything that you need to understand how to live pleasing to God, to live out every aspect of your life in faithfulness to him. That this scripture, it is able to equip you for every single good work that you need to do before the sight of God. And so this is a very clear statement to the sufficiency of Scripture, that that Paul does not tell Timothy that he needs to pick up his Bible and then go to the pagan religious texts in order to know how to live. He doesn't tell Timothy to go to the pagans. He tells Timothy to go to the revelation of God found in the Scripture. And this brings us to the antithesis of opposing worldviews. That word antithesis, we're, we're talking about something being the opposite. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, when talking about antithesis in this particular context, It defines it this way and says that it is an opposition of opinions, a controversy. So in other words, it it is two separate worldviews, bringing us back to our topic today, standing against each other, that they oppose one another. This brings me to a quote by Francis Schaeffer in uh, his excellent book, A Christian Manifesto. He says, The basic problems of the Christians in this country— in the last 80 years or so, in regard to society and in regard to government, is that they have seen things in bits and pieces instead of totals. Let me read that last part. Is that they have seen things in bits and pieces instead of totals. So think about that in terms of where we are as Christians living in the year 2021, when this podcast is being recorded, do we fall prey to this temptation that Schaefer is talking about, where instead of seeing things, instead of seeing complete systems of thought that are driving the issues in our society, do we focus on individual aspects so much that we fail to understand what is going on at all? Let me give you an example. Think about governmental issues. Schaefer raises that in this quote. He raises that in his book, A Christian Manifesto. He raises that in his work several times. But think about the issues facing government. We no longer believe in the God of the Bible as a society. So we elevate the position of government to a place where it was never intended to be, biblically speaking. Instead of government being seen as God's servant, being subservient to his rules, meaning that we understand the government is called to protect rights, to protect human rights given by God, 
that the government is called to reward that which is good, to punish that which is evil. We could elaborate on that more, but I think you get my basic idea that that is what it means for a government to be underneath God, that it is defined by him. It's, it's exact duties and roles are given by God. Now, because our society has abandoned that idea, what is government now seen to be? It's a free for all. There is no boundaries that are concrete any longer in, in many of our societies today. And if we fail to see the shift in worldview, if we fail to see that shift in worldview from a society which was seeking to live for the glory of the God of the Bible, who is seeking to submit to him, who is seeking to understand all of life, including the government, according to the word of God, if we fail to see the shift in society from that point of view over to a secular point of view, it doesn't acknowledge the God of Scripture, then we're not going to have a robust understanding of why the issues that we see regarding governmental authority, such as overreach, as we saw in 2020 with COVID restrictions and John MacArthur and James Coates having to stand up against that sort of thing. If we don't understand that shift in worldview, we're going to fail to see the totality of what is going on. And as Schaefer says, we're being so focused on the bits and pieces that we're failing to understand what is truly happening. Let me give you another example. Take the issue of abortion. The issue of abortion where many today would claim that it is my body and it is my choice. But it is not your choice to commit Murder, because you are accountable to God as the judge of the universe. And God is very clear in his word that babies in the womb are human and must be, must be protected. Psalm one hundred thirty nine thirteen. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. So notice that here in the, the psalmist talking, that God knitted him together in a womb. Another example is found in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. Let me read these few verses here. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined. As the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, the children, of course, we're talking about specifically to the to the woman as well. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So what is the Bible doing here? The Bible is protecting life in the womb that the baby who is harmed is to be protected according to this passage. And so those living in accordance with a Christian worldview will hold to the position of the sanctity of life, seeking to protect the life of human beings inside and outside of the womb if they are acting biblically, if that Christian, if that individual holding to a Christian worldview, seeking to hold to it, is acting biblically, they will uphold the sanctity of life. However, as we consider the atheistic secular morality, it has no solid foundation ultimately upon which to stand on this issue, bringing us to a clash in world views yet again. Now, I'm not saying that every single person who is pro-life is a Christian, there are atheists out there who are pro-life. What I am saying is that they have no ultimate foundation in their worldview for which to provide stability and consistency in that viewpoint. Because secular morality is ever-changing. It changes all of the time. How can you have a solid ground for human dignity apart from the fact that every single human being is made in the image of God? that you can't have that type of solid footing because any other foundation that you give will change except for God. If you use the opinion of society to say that human beings have worth, and that can change, 
I mean, look at history. Look at the slaughters of the past as an example of that. Example, Nazi Germany. Hitler thought that he was purifying the human race by killing millions. He, he thought that he was doing a good thing according to his worldview when in fact he was committing a horrendous evil, a horrendously evil and sick action. What about the Roman Colosseum in the ancient days where people used to fight in these gladiator battles and be slaughtered? We could talk about other things in ancient Rome, such as how Christians were literally lit on fire in Nero's garden as torches. And so we see that, that morality, those viewpoints of morality, those worldviews outside of Christianity cannot provide a stable foundation for the sanctity of life. But we as Christians, we believe in the sanctity of life because God has revealed it in his word. Because it is grounded in the character of God and his revelation, which will never change. What I want you to see is the antithesis, the opposing nature between worldviews here. In this example, that's what I'm getting at, that there is no neutrality. That you must have a biblical worldview. You must be grounded in the Bible on everything. If you're going to be consistent because it is only biblical Christianity that is consistent. The Bible alone is inspired by God as his sufficient word. Therefore, and here is my main point in this first episode of this podcast. When we fight for the truth on issues like abortion, where we are fighting for the life of human beings in the womb. We must fight with a full-orbed biblical understanding and don't leave a biblical understanding behind when going into any part of your life or when you go into any sort of a contentious cultural issue. Don't leave the Bible on the shelf. Don't practice a Christless conservatism. Take every thought captive to the Word of God. Bring it back to Scripture. It is the divine power that God has given us to destroy the false ideas of the world. And so we must not lay it on the shelf. We must take it with us. It is the sword that He has given to us to do battle with the enemy. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So there's a very clear contrast here. You are either for Christ or you are against Christ. There's not a middle ground. There's not a neutral position according to our Lord. And so as his followers, as those who have been saved by him, who have placed faith in him and who have been given this wonderful redemption by his grace, we must be fully submissive to him in every way. We must be fully captive to him in every way. What would the opposite of that be? What would the opposite of that be that if we weren't captive to Christ, it would mean that we were being captive to the world, the ideas of the world. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it makes this very clear. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Why? Don't we need some sort of insight from the pagan world to be under, to understand the character of God and how he has called us to live? I mean, surely we're not supposed to be fully captive to Christ. Does that make sense? Well, of course it makes sense because of what Paul said earlier. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, that starting at the end of verse 2, in Christ, verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In other words, you have everything that you need in Christ. He is sufficient. 
And so for us as Christians, we seek to honor him. We seek to live biblically. We seek to, to be submissive to him in every single aspect of our worldview. That there is not one single aspect of our life that we do not seek to live to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We seek to bring him glory in everything, which means that we need to know the word of God. And we need to be obedient to it in every way. So we don't practice some sort of an impossible neutrality. We are firmly committed to the scripture. We don't seek to go to the pagans to learn what we need. I'm not saying that pagans don't get some things right, that unbelievers don't get some things right. They do. Um, There are certainly individuals who... You know, if I I need my tire changed, I'm going to go have an unbelieving mechanic do it over um, someone who's a Christian and has no idea how to change a tire. Um, There are other things that we can see. You know, there are good uh, unbelievers who who are making some good strides against certain issues, such as critical race theory. Right now, they're they're critiquing that viewpoint, and they're right on that. But it's not their worldview which is producing the truth. They're borrowing from our worldview in order to find that truth because all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. I want to read this quote to you from Cornelius Van Til. He says, The Bible is thought of as authoritative on everything of which it speaks. Moreover, it speaks of everything. If there's one thing that I want you to take home from this podcast episode, it is this quote right here. Because... If it is true that the Bible is given to us by God, that it is his revelation to us, and it is, and since he has told us that it is his sufficient word, that he has given us everything that we need in the scripture to know how to live pleasing before him, and since it speaks of everything, as Cornelius Van Til says, and by that we don't mean that it tells you how to change your oil in your vehicle, we, we don't mean that. that. That would be a misunderstanding of what Van Til says. He actually says that in Christian apologetics. He talks about that a little bit. But because it speaks of everything that we need to know in life, to live pleasing to God, and to know how to live in every single area of life for his glory, which is our goal as Christians, then we must not just go to the Bible for doctrines of the church. We must not just go to the Bible for what may be classically known in our society as spiritual things. We must go to the Bible for everything. Whenever we're talking about the role of government, we must anchor that in the Scripture. Whenever we're talking about the issues surrounding the sanctity of life, we must be thoroughly biblical in those things. Whatever the case we must ground ourselves in the Holy Word of God. So whenever we think about an issue, whatever it may be, such as the abortion issue, we must not only see that someone is wrong by supporting abortion, we must also see that they are wrong in their worldview, that they are wrong in their belief system about life. This means that we face these issues understanding that Christianity is a complete system of thought standing as the truth in opposition against every other system. Christians must not only be able to spot individual issues going on in society like homosexuality, education problems, uh, the racist rhetoric of critical race theory, and so on, We must develop the ability to see the false worldviews producing such beliefs. We we must spot the false worldviews that are behind all of these things and to see the interconnected nature of the issues of our day. We must think about the foundational belief systems behind individual issues. And we must confront not only specific issues. We do need to confront specific issues but not only specific issues, but the systems of thought as a whole with the truth of Scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Point being, you got to get to the root of the issue. That is what it means to engage in worldview thinking. 
And I pray that this podcast will play some sort of a role, at least, in helping Christians toward that end. That it will help you to think more biblically. That it will help you to engage faithfully as a believer in this world and to see every single aspect of your life as being used for the glory of God. You can find some resources and quotations in the show notes below. Please subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a review, all of that good stuff. Be sure to go to the ChristianManifesto.org and check out the wide variety of articles there. There are tools dealing with everything from politics to theology to apologetics for the equipping of the church. Be sure to follow myself, Jared Links, on Twitter and Facebook. We'll see you in the next episode. Until then, remember the note of Scripture that you may be always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. God bless.